Oh, aloha. Welcome to this show. Uh, we're the state of the state of Hawaii on a think tech Hawaii, of course. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Our topic for this show is a focus on Hawaii's position and politics in the vast Pacific region. Hawaii is the most uh, isolated ocean archipelago in the world, but its relations with numerous other neighbor island nations has endured for centuries and has been active all that time. However, there is now a newcomer in the region, China. China is seeking association with numerous Pacific Island nations. What does, ti- what does China intend to do or to change or to, to live within new relationships? What is this all about? And what is the effect to be on Hawaii's role and uh, on uh, U.S. policy, perhaps? We have a knowledgeable guest tonight from the Eurasian Group to help us uh, think about this with a little more clarity and maybe a few more facts and understandings. And he can explain some of these developments in the regions and their context and what what might be happening to make things move as it looks like they are. And this is, of course, Ralph Winnie Jr., who directs Eurasia Center's China Center. It's Eurasia Group's China Center, and where he does uh, international business dealings and practices international law. So welcome, Ralph, to Think Tech. Aloha. Uh, yeah. Stephanie, glad to be with you. And you are Hawaiian. I'm yeah. sorry. You're you're so you're in Washington D.C. now, but you are a Hawaii boy. So you're Correct. A local, yeah. Local guy. Yeah. Graduated from Punahou. Yes. From so I, that brings me quite. What was that? I'm from Kailua. Oh, and from Kailua. Okay. Well, that just shows your investment here is authentic and. Uh, Driven by um, good good uh, intentions and hopes for um, Hawaii, the state of Hawaii. Um, I wanted to point out that recently, as you know, um, China has sent its foreign minister Wang Yi, and he has visited at least nine uh, uh, Pacific Islander nations, and uh, in these uh, visits, I I've read. And maybe you can tell us a little more about it or what uh, its association is all about. Um, he's uh, intended to build a pan Pacific agreement among uh, island nations. However, um, he finished up his visit with perhaps only one or two uh, associations put in place, which were um, tentative, but at least um, he's put out the message at what his goal might be. So I thought maybe you could start us off with helping us understand what what that means, that China's foreign minister is in the Pacific hanging out and making friends. So where where are we going with this? Well, I think it's it's very interesting that China is now wanting to grow and expand their sphere of influence uh, in the Asia Pacific region with a focus on uh, on uh, Hawaii, Micronesia, Guam, Saipan. Not only does it have military significance, right? Because the U.S. military is very ensconced in uh, near Guam, Wake Island, near the Philippines. But at the same time, the Chinese are trying to um, develop markets um, where they can extract and, and engage um, with the new leaders in order to. Um, get resources to grow and expand the Chinese economy. As more and more Chinese are moved out of poverty into the middle class, it creates increased energy needs and is driving up domestic consumption uh, throughout uh, China. And uh, it makes sense for China to want to um, engage with different countries in the Asia Pacific region um, with an eye to expanding their sphere of influence. And as some people say, a a direct competitor against the United States. But I think that still remains to be seen exactly um, whether there are going to be any malign um, repercussions from China's engagement in the in the Asia Pacific region. Right. Uh, You're 
moving forward to um, that unfortunate uh, consideration, we 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 probably uh, learned from you in some discussion of it. But I had read that um, Chinese are after fish because they've got billions of people to feed, and um, the fishing right. the fisheries of these nations are are rich and large, gigantic, mm -hmm. and also at this point reasonably managed uh but with china going in for something like that could change those dynamics really fast but but is is it really about fishes is it really basically fishes or is there more to it well i think it starts with needing these um natural resources um to help stimulate and grow the chinese economy and it's also about engaging in a form of soft power or as their detractors would say trying to exert domination or control over other countries. I think um, it's important that we engage, you know, with China on a personal and professional basis in order to grow and expand the relationship. Yes, that's, that's very longstanding and it's uh, between the United States and China that can create a positive dynamic for both countries. Mm -hmm. For instance, we should be engaging small and medium-sized companies um with between china and the united states we shouldn't focus necessarily on a multinational we should focus on small and medium-sized companies help get them into china and help chinese small and medium-sized companies engage in hawaii and in, uh, and in the mainland united states because oh, that's the engine of growth is small business oh yeah okay there of course of course um so i wondered uh about the position of um well the west well in in us i suppose is is it is it correct to describe the relationship is over the last couple decades um and since their and since the what in independence in the 70s right is when the territorial um relationships ended but um has it been um more a matter of benign neglect in the relations uh, among the Western countries or the U.S.? which Well, is a most, well yeah. we have to understand that um, the Chinese think for a very, very long term. You know, they uh, and they engage on the personal level to develop the business strategy. The United States thinks differently. We have the Western mentality, and it's all about going over there, trying to do the business without necessarily understanding um, the history or the culture of the Chinese. And that has not served um, foreigners well, traditionally. Um, but someone like Nixon, who was had the idea of the U.S. being a strong ally and partner of China as a way to bridge that divide that, between China and Russia to allow the U.S. to become the dominant player in the region by having that close relationship with China, I think is key. And the Chinese recognize that America never tried to occupy them, never tried to dominate them like the Europeans did. We helped them in their fight against the Japanese. And there is a reservoir of goodwill and support because of that. Now, we've had to challenge them, the Chinese on the mercantilist policies, which is what Trump was doing in imposing these tariffs. And as long as you can produce desired results that will benefit Chinese and American small and medium-sized business, you're going to have a win-win situation. Um, when the mayor of Huntsville, Alabama, came to New York and he spoke to an organization called the National Committee for U.S.-China Relations, which I'm a member of, it was very inspiring to hear his talk about how the Chinese, um, when they first came into the community, everybody was scared. They thought they were going to come in and dominate them. And what the Chinese did in, in, instead was ingratiate themselves in the community, get themselves involved with the church, with the, um, the PTA, with the soccer games, um, and in, ingratiated themselves with the, the, with the people. And from there, they were able to develop strong, partnerships in the community, and it also served the people of Huntsville when they wanted to go overseas to China to be able to grow and expand their businesses. And 
this is what is going to need to happen for the U.S. and the Chinese relationship in order to, to grow and expand in a very positive way, um, is for the community, the people, to have the people-to-people -people exchange and relationship building based on mutual respect and trust. Mm -hmm. Well, does there have, uh, okay, so getting to the state level of, in Hawaii's role, is it um, a matter of tourism with, uh, with China? Hawaii, what, what is Hawaii's main uh, relation? Well, uh, as you know, um, Linda Lingle saw, um, had Ted Liu at the time sign a memo of understanding with the Chinese to open up um, flights to encourage um, ch uh, Chinese tourism um, to Hawaii. And that was very much a success. And it that was, was the, her governor, the former yes, Republican governor. Right, right. Um, that she believed that it was important to expand um, Hawaii's opportunities to the Chinese. That so you could not just rely on Japan, because if there was a recession in Japan, it, it adversely impacts Hawaii because they're not going to have the influx of tourists. So they looked at China and they looked at this um, billion dollar market. And at the, at the time, the Chinese government was looking to um, increase domestic consumption. What people don't understand is the Chinese save and invest so much, they don't spend enough, which affects and impacts their economy. We, of course, in the United States, have the opposite problem. We spend too much, we don't save. So what was happening is the Chinese were saving so much, they weren't spending, and the government had to figure out what kind of industry can we support to encourage our people to start spending? So they looked at tourism and leisure development, and they started lifting the travel restrictions. They started expanding the domestic airline routes in China. Um, they um, started um, encouraging um, automobile ownership, and this and it became a status thing to travel and take a vacation. And um, I noticed this when I was in China, being on the airline, on domestic airlines, flying to look at various projects. And, you know, there were people on the planes that had never left the province. It was the first time they were flying and they were going to go and visit and, and um, take a vacation. And, um, you know, the, the government was mandating companies provide vacation time for um, their Chinese employees. And projects were opening up um, in areas um, where there were natural, pristine beach areas to promote and develop resorts. So Linda Lingle understood this and made it a point to sign this memorandum, uh, which would allow domestic Chinese to be able to travel to Hawaii. Now, the problem that we find with Hawaii and the Chinese is it's very expensive. It's much easier for Chinese to go to Cuba, to go to Jamaica, um, where they can go on, yeah, really cheap, cheap travel tours and they don't have to spend as much money as they would if they come to Hawaii. Um, well, yeah, now, so why, why are those trips less expensive when it's twice as far from China? Um, um, because of the, the cost of the hotel, the cost of transportation, um, being in Cuba, you know, I know because um, it's it's very easy, you know, to just get a little contraption to, to that will take you around the island. Um, mm -hmm. The hotel rooms um, are very modest. You mm -hmm. can um, do bed and breakfast. And the government maintains a very tight rein, but at the time, they were starting to um, allow bed and breakfast, allow people to um, have their own small businesses focused on tourism and leisure over there in Cuba. Well, and, um, okay. and now in yeah. Hawaii, there's there are a lot of uh, state regulations, the the income tax, um, the hotel, the car mm -hmm. rental, the tour packages. I mean, it's just been increasing. So that's been a challenge to to get the Chinese to commit to Hawaii for that reason. But nevertheless, yeah. the, Hawaii is still a natural, attractive destination for Chinese 
because they are more culturally accepted per se, or they feel that they're going to be more culturally accepted in Hawaii because of the strong Asian um, uh, presence in the islands. Yeah. Well, that that's uh, interesting. I um, wanted to get back into the Pacific Island areas where uh, I have a little bit of experience and have heard even more, but there where, where it does they can get to those quicker than they can right. get to Hawaii. But um, I've seen that they, they are self-contained when they go, for instance, in Palau. I mean, they go in on chartered Chinese planes, sure. they stay in Chinese hotels, they run right. uh, everything out. Yeah. So how is that? Is that catering to keeping their expenses low? Or why, why do they do that instead of putting into the economy? I mean, isn't that the way the relationship uh, towards development usually goes? Well, that's been a criticism of the Chinese, is how much engagement um, are, do they have with the local community? Are they actually investing in the, in the local economy? And are people benefiting? Um, traditionally, when they went to Africa, they just did everything and took all the resources and left. And the the people didn't appear to benefit. And there was a backlash towards Chinese investment there for that reason. Um, the Chinese started to tra- to change their approach, and uh, because they were bringing over convicts into Africa to do a lot of the uh, construction. Um, and they didn't believe the Africans had the acumen or the wherewithal to be able to properly finish the project, per se. So there, there's that mindset on the part of the Chinese, you know, that these people, you know, may are some are not as are are not up to our level or our standards. So we, it's just easier for us to send our people and do everything ourselves. Um, so they're not internationally comfortable. That in general, I mean, just generally speaking, the Chinese and the business people there, they're they're not comfortable working internationally or with other other nations. People. Well, um, it, traditionally, they have focused on um, what's in the best interest of China, and it's sort of a new thing to be able to go and and engage overseas. Um, but. As more and more Chinese go abroad and they work and they study in the United States and in Europe and, and go to Africa, the whole dynamic has changed. And they realize how important it is to make friends in the local community, which is why by, I gave that example of Huntsville, Alabama, why mm-hmm. they realized when, when they came into Huntsville that they could not afford to just be adverse in the community. They had to to engage on a personal and professional level um, in order to achieve a win-win situation for both parties. And that's what they're going to need to do in order to be successful in the Asia-Pacific region. They're going to have to um, engage with the, with the locals uh, and create a positive dynamic you know, to improve the quality of life for the locals and to help grow and expand the Chinese network and the acquisition of the resources that they need. Well, are are you thinking that 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 is going to be the major thrust of their outreach? Because there's a lot of criticism of their um their their diplomacy and um also the debt debt traps that they right. set. So yes, yeah, Sri Lanka debt- right has been very mm-hmm. forceful and vocal about that issue with the mm-hmm. port. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, okay. again, um, people need to know what they're getting into when they engage with the Chinese. They have to realize the Chinese are very uh, hard bargainers, they're very tough negotiators, um, mm-hmm. and you have to be ready for what they propose and figure out if it's going to be the right situation for you. I mean, well, e- even in this country, I mean, we borrow a lot of money, but people are so desperate that they don't care that they may have to take. Um, these high interest loans because they're just they just need need the money right away. Yet these loans are considered very usurious, mm-hmm. but they're allowed um, at certain at certain levels for, to get people over that hump. So if you understand that you're dealing with the Chinese and you're dealing with a situation where the, you know you could get caught up in a per se 
debt trap. You have to know how to get into it and when to exit. So you're not adversely affected, but you have to go in with, you know, what is your ultimate goal? Um, well, yeah. yeah, there's there's that issue. And then what's been described going on, you know, at the local level in the in the island nations. Yeah. Um, and um, that they are um, susceptible to and desperate enough and with climate change wreaking all kinds right. of havoc. They need big bucks to to do the kind of uh, development that will protect them and their nation. Well, and but, it gives the U.S. an opportunity to go in, you know, and yeah. to help these these countries um, if they are so uncomfortable dealing with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. But many of these countries don't feel that way. They want to welcome the Chinese investment into their community. Now, what is the end result of that is going to be the key question moving forward. Because the Chinese um, have been criticized, you know, repeatedly for their um, their business practices, mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, many times unfairly, but at the same time, it, you know, if you develop a bad reputation, people are not going to want to deal with you, even if they are hurting so mm -hmm. bad. You know, they'll look to another partner. So well, it's yeah. in the Chinese interest to make sure that the other side you know, um, feels like it's a win-win relationship and that they are going to be. And at the same time, the U.S. should treat it as an opportunity to exert U.S. soft power yeah. and to show um, how we are exceptional in engaging and, and trading with other countries. I mean, we don't occupy. You know, uh, we are that shining city on the hill where people come to escape oppression and know that when they come to the United States, that if they work hard, they can achieve the, the American dream. And that's what we need to instill and promote when we're engaging, you know, with other countries. Well, it, it, the alarm of what that foreign minister, the Chinese foreign, foreign minister um, accomplished is at least one, if not two, uh, nations that agreed to shift their allegiance yeah. to the China One policy and would uh, stop relating to Taiwan and would only relate to the China right. One policy, which was yeah. alarming because they had been on the Western side of things. So is uh, do you think that the U.S. is attending to this? And does this seem like uh, it needs to have some uh, attention? We need to have a direct approach with China. And at the same time, we need to stay active and engage in the Asia Pacific region. We can't afford to alienate our allies or our partners. And at the same time, we have to stand up strong against the Chinese who respect strength. They don't respect weakness. And we don't have anything to apologize for. I mean, that's a big key. You know, we have a lot to offer. The country is a force for good. And that's what needs to be promoted to the countries in the Asia Pacific region. And I'll, and you'll see more and more of them wanting to ally with the United States, but still maintain a strong relationship with China. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese need to do, continue to do a better job of engaging in the community mm -hmm. and working with the people rather than being perceived as someone that's coming in and just wanting stuff and then is going to leave. And that the country is going to be left in a worse off position. That's not necessarily the case, but that's the perception. And when you have that perception, you have to work really hard to change the mindset of people. Well, Hawaii could work on that. The state of Hawaii actually could take an initiative or the step towards making huh. some things happen in the state. Uh, right. I don't know that that, present, that presently is an ongoing initiative in the in the state do you well hawaii is facing many challenges right now because of the effects of covid um hawaii desperately needs tourism dollars mm -hmm. um and hawaii desperately needs to diversify and ex and uh expand um into other areas other industries mm -hmm. um and that's going to mean you know more changes you know um People come to Hawaii, they don't necessarily know, 
the way, right way to do things in Hawaii and it rubs the locals the wrong way. Yeah. Um, you're going to face more and more of these issues as Hawaii continues to get more and more business or coming into the state. Uh, but right now, things, you know, people want to get to Hawaii. They want that vacation, um, but it's becoming more and more expensive. And, and hopefully the new governor is going to be able to put an economic package together that's going to be able to attract and engage new business and, and to be able to bring more and more local people back from the mainland to Hawaii because it's so expensive to live there. Yeah, yeah. Very, very more and true. more. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the whole Hawaii, Ohana, the family is so important. And I think that that's a role model and example for, you know, the rest of our nation. Oh, well, this um, is true. That's a very good point. But it also would embrace Chinese, too. The Chinese people would find, I certainly find themselves welcome in Hawaii. Oh, but, absolutely. Because family is very important in China. And, well, they, yeah. and they can respect and understand the Hawaii Ohana. Um, we just need to get more and more of them over to Hawaii um, yeah. and make it more affordable for them to, you know, to spend their vacation. But mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of good opportunities and possibilities, um, especially with Hainan Island um, mm -hmm. and also engaging directly with the tourism ministry in China, like Linda Lingle did. So I'm hopeful that the next okay. governor will take that same approach. And talk and engage with the Chinese and say, how can we make it affordable for them to to take their trip and spend time in Hawaii? Because we really want their tourism dollars. And at the same time, we know there are projects that they can involve themselves here in Hawaii that will benefit our economy and benefit our local people. So then speaking of initiatives that China has uh, in in play. Um, I did uh, see that they've got a 20 year old initiative that's that's like a four trillion dollar effort that is labeled um, the Belt and Road Initiative. Yes. So, OK. What, one belt, just, one road. Yeah. One well, belt, one form road. Of, yeah, it's a form of soft diplomacy. It, it, it allows China to be able to trade and engage with uh, Central Southeast Asia. Um, as a way to um, e e exert Chinese influence, guidance, support, um, and engagement with these various countries. Um, they think that by promoting strong economic development um, within between China and Central and Southeast Asia, you will be able to create a win-win situation where everybody benefits and there won't be the need to have um, control and, well, disorder and war and famine and disease, pestilence. There will be a, a strong economic, political um, and social framework that will be developed that where the economies of these countries will grow and expand and China will be able to benefit and their people will be able to um, continue to grow and develop more and more people out of poverty in the middle class and more jobs available, more expansion of opportunities within China um, to develop the provinces. So um, the key will be what will the personal relationships be that develop from the Silk Road Initiative? What kind of economic projects will develop that will, will allow for a continued personal growth and expansion of the, the political and social dynamic? Uh, that's a very good point. And that, that operates at the U.S. policy uh, development level, policymaking level, as yes. well as the, what the state of Hawaii can can contribute yeah. to that effort here in the Pacific. And um, it is a state, not a country. Right. So in a little different position as far as trying to affect that, grow that relationship. But nevertheless, there is a lot that can be done according to, to what you And we say. have to worry oh. about North Korea, okay? Mm -hmm. Because... Pearl Harbor was attacked, right? When the U.S. was attacked, it was Pearl Harbor. Yeah. You know, North Korea 
could fire a missile one day and it could obliterate Hawaii, unfortunately. So you need to have a strong relationship with China who has strong influence with the North Korea for that reason as well. Yes, and I think that that's such an important point as we're running out of time here, Ralph. Let's come back and talk about the whole uh, risk issue, um, given things can go sideways and downwards on occasion, and we would like to try and intervene. Uh, before anything like that happens. And these these efforts of uh, development and cooperation and uh, uh, mm-hmm. that we talked about are the ways to build the bridges that will keep us from getting into that kind of a mess because right. here we sit right on a powder keg. So um, and, and Hawaii has that unique um, perspective in terms of dealing with the West and the Asian side of things that can yeah. bring people together in a very positive way because people have a positive um, support and belief towards Hawaii, the positive outlook, which is very important. But now Hawaii needs to harness that and they need to create tax breaks and various other incentives to bring in business that will work and engage with the locals um, so that the Ohana spirit is promoted, maintained and enhanced and not destroyed. And Hawaii is very humble and doesn't applaud and doesn't uh, brag about what it has to offer. And it's very rich in resources that that way, human resources, and could uh, really contribute in some significant way. So so let's talk about it again, because we have a new administration coming on and new challenges. And as you say, the North Korea thing is there, too. So um, that's an important place to to have the state uh, knowledgeable, have uh, awareness heightened about what all the possibilities and risks are for us. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here to discuss this uh, potential relationship we have with them and how it is that we can uh, avoid uh, um, uh, ones that are not, you know, productive. Mm -hmm. So um, this is uh, the state of the state of Hawaii. And our guest has been Ralph Winnie Jr. from the Eurasian Group's uh, China Center, and we're pleased to have had all the information he's imparted tonight. Thank you so much, Ralph, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again on Think Tech Hawaii in two weeks. I'm Stephanie Stoldalton, your host. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.